In this video, we're going to talk about how to come out of counterfeit Christianity. So the question, how do I come out of counterfeit Christianity, really boils down to cleansing counterfeit Christianity out of you. I know that in the word, particularly in Revelation, you see that God says, come out of her, come out of Babylon. But you understand that God is using that as symbolism. And I know, I, you know, I am very careful about the way that I speak. I would never want to add to the scroll or change something that God says. So I'm going to explain that statement. Are you in a church or is the church in you? Well, it's both. But the determination as to whether you are in the church is whether or not the church is in you. That's determined by your heart. You are justified by your heart. That's what Romans 10.10 10 tells us. And so you are justified by how you are worshiping. What are you worshiping within your heart? God says that he wants true worshipers who worship in truth and in spirit. If you are worshiping him in, your, in truth and in his spirit, well, that's going to be in your heart because he tells us that his spirit is in our heart. That's where he's working with us. So although what's in your heart is the determining factor to where you belong, what you're in, whether you're in Babylon or you're in Zion, the determining factor is what is in your heart. So people have been contacting me, particularly since I since posting the video regarding the mark of the beast, and they want to know, well, how do I know if I'm in counterfeit Christianity or if the church I go to is counterfeit? How do I know what I need to separate from? So I want you to understand this. If God is telling you to separate from something, you indeed need to separate from it. But it's not separating from that thing that is defiling you. Nothing on the outside of you is defiling you. It's what's inside of your heart. Nothing outside of you is sanctifying you. It's what is in your heart. What are you receiving from God's Holy Spirit? And then he's the one inside of your heart who's going to sanctify you. It's really important that you understand this so, so clearly. Because if you don't understand it, you're going to start blaming other people. You're going to blame that pastor that you think deceived you. You're going to blame, you know endless, an endless number of things. And this happens quite frequently when people are coming out of cults, when they're realizing when God finally convicts them and they finally return to him, which is the reason I have everyone fast before I start working with them is so that God is the one that's convicting them, not me. It's not my job to save you. It's not my job to convict you. That is what God does. But when people start to realize this, they start to get a resentment externally. And inevitably, I have to remind them that, hey, wait a minute, you're handed over to delusion. The word tells us that we're handed over to delusion when we did not love truth. That was in you. And God does ultimately work with them and deal with them on that once they have understanding. So if you've been deceived, it's because you did not love truth. I've been there. Everybody's been there, you guys. Don't let a spirit of pride keep you from doing this work, keep you from acknowledging that. Now, I was speaking with someone recently who's told me that they're still going to church, still discerning the, th the things that I've been uh, talking about with God, which is good. That's right. You can you discern that with God until it's very clear to you. So whatever his answer is very clear to you. I don't have a problem being corrected if I'm wrong. This None of this is about me. It's got to come from God. So I'm also not going to have some sort of like an issue with you not believing things because I tell you that this is what he tells me. It has to come from him. You have your own relationship with him. And so I would never want you to set me up as an idol and start making decisions to root things out of your life that he has not convicted you of just because I said it. So here's the thing. I know what God has taught me. I know what he has said to me. And I have full confidence that he will teach the same things to people around me or whoever is his. So here is what I suggest to you. Don't get tripped up on whether or not that church is true because it's not about a church. It's about what's in your heart. You're not going to be saved by what congregation you belong to, what tradition you belong to or anything else. You know, the way I feel about that, that is going to lead you to the mark of the beast. But regardless of whether that is something that he has yet revealed to you, what you need to be praying for and leaning into is asking God to remove counterfeit Christianity from your heart. That's what you need to be praying for. Lord, sanctify me, clean me up of any deception that I have believed. 
clean me up of anything that I have believed that is incorrect. That's the way he's going to work with you. That was the prayer that I said to him. Goodness, it was like two years ago, I think, that I said that prayer to him. Because I had realized that I was that I had ingested false doctrine regarding pre-tribulation rapture. And when I realized that I had ingested that, I was horrified. And then I wondered, well, what else? What else is there? And that began a cleansing journey. Because I asked the question and I leaned into that question. So don't just ask it and then wait for him to do what he's going to do. If you know you've been deceived about one thing, he convicts you of that. Now you need to search in the word for what is the truth and sit with his spirit and pull on him and fast. The first thing that I did when I realized that I had been deceived was to fast. Next thing I had to acknowledge is why I was deceived because God hands us over to delusion when what? When we do not love truth. How was I not loving truth? Well, I had ingested that doctrine from a false teacher named David Jeremiah. Again, instead of me knowing what the word is and the fact that these people are using the word rapture, instead of the language that God has established in his word, which is first resurrection, to come for his people, to gather his people, there's no language of second coming. There's no language of rapture in the word. And so because I didn't return to truth, which is his word, and I felt that I needed some, I don't know, some theologian or whatever to tell me what God can tell me himself, I ingested false doctrine and it entered my heart. And you know what? In entering my heart, it also caused me to not understand my covenant, not understand that there is a reason why God has us here during that time, that we are working something out. And that something is our covenant. We are working out our salvation, as Peter says. He could come and pick us up anytime he wants. But as it is, he is established in his word that these things are going to happen and he won't come before them. He is not going to come before the abomination is, of desolation is set up, before the mark of the beast is extended or forced on people, before the reign of the Antichrist. He's even not going to come before his great wrath begins. Now, don't misunderstand, we won't be here, or his people will not be here for the bulls of wrath, and his wrath does indeed pass over them, but Satan's wrath doesn't. And there is a period of at least 45 days, because in Daniel, we see that from the time the the abomination of desolation is set up and incites God's jealous wrath, that's the 1290th day, blessed is the one who reaches 1335 days. And in Matthew, we see that when you see standing in the holy place... The abomination of desolation. You better flee. Don't turn to go grab anything. Get the heck out of Dodge. And in those days, there will be great distress, such as has not happened. So if you, such as has not happened from, since the beginning of the world. Now look, you have to take the entire scriptures together. The entire Bible, you've got to take it together and understand that that's the timeline of things. God's people will be here. And if, you, if that wasn't enough for you right there, Jesus says, those days will be cut short for the sake of the elect. I mean, are they not going to be saved too, the elect? He's referring to them as the elect. Otherwise, no one would have survived. He's not talking about no one would have, would have survived physically. He's talking about God's people, the elect, would have been just broken. Those are going to be some hard times. And you know why? God tells us in Revelation 2 through 3. In Revelation 2 through 3, you see how he's rebuking each one of those churches. Let's understand the churches as we understand churches today. These are the assemblies that are gathering in these respective areas. Smyrna, Philadelphia, etc. Ephesus, etc. And he rebukes those churches, five out of seven of the churches. And to two of the churches, he says, some of you are going to go into jail for about 10 days. Stand firm, even unto death. And he tells us in, to the church in Philadelphia that because those people have pleased him and because they are standing firm in what he has taught, he's going to spare them from the hour of trial and testing that's going to come on the whole earth. Well, what's that? What, wait a minute. I thought, I thought he was going to spare all of us and he was going to come and pick us up. What is this? That's a false gospel. That is a false gospel being taught in counterfeit Christianity and we ingested it because we didn't love truth, because we didn't go to his word. So if I say anything to you that you don't know specifically, personally in his word, you sit and study it. You go to his spirit and you ask him, are these things true? What do I need to do in order to please you? How do I need to be 
teach me how to be attuned to you as I'm listening so that I can discern what is true and what your will is. So understand that there are absolutely going to be here people here who are going to endure the hour of trial and testing that's going to come on the whole world. And for the sake of the elect, those days will be cut short. Otherwise, no one would have survived. There's going to be some hard times. What do you think about that? Why do you think that is? Why would he put us through that? I'll tell you exactly why. In fact, he tells us is exactly why. Revelation 2 through 3, he tells us all of the reasons, all the things that these different assemblies are doing, all the things these different churches are doing. And he tells them to repent, and he tells them to turn from their wicked ways, and he tells them that their deeds are unfinished in the sight of his God. Wait a minute. I thought, I, but I thought Jesus paid for all of that. Didn't he do all that for us? What's this deeds talk? Isn't that works? Isn't that back to the law? No. Your faith without works is dead. If God is not producing fruit through you, through your behaviors and this ministry that he has built in you, your deeds are unfinished in the sight of his God. So here's the bottom line, is that the people who are going to be here during that time, their deeds are unfinished in the sight of Christ's God. That's the issue. They have not fulfilled their covenant. They're being given an opportunity to fulfill their covenant, and now they're going to have to go through the fire. Now they're going to have to go through trial and testing in order to demonstrate who they have chosen. Because he tried to cleanse them and they would not be cleansed, Therefore, they will not be clean again until his wrath has subsided. That is what the word tells us. That is the heart of God. You know, a lot of people look at scriptures and they say, oh, well, that was already fulfilled. That happened with the Israelites. That happened with so-and-so. Has God not been known to repeat paradigms in the word? Has God not been known to have a consistent heart throughout the word? You think he accept, expected something different from Jews that, than he expects from Christians? The burden was on Jews, but Christians have it easy. Christians are already saved. Christ paid it all for them. They're in a unilateral covenant. So first covenant was reciprocal, was collaborative, was an if-then covenant. If you do this, if you obey, then you will be saved. But the second covenant is unilateral. Do you hear how ridiculous that is? But this is what we've ingested, and it needs to come out of us. So here's what I recommend to you. I recommend that you fast, that you circumcise from everything. Don't start having conversations with man about this. You need to receive this from God because man can justify themselves out of anything. You need to receive this from God. I recommend that you fast, and I recommend that you ask him to lead you and purge you of counterfeit Christianity, to show you clearly where you have been deceived and what his truth is. And then you have to receive that and you have to pursue it. And let me tell you something that I have never, I don't think I've ever labored so much as I did at that time because man, I was really bogged down. And then I would get frustrated during that process. So I want to share this bit of wisdom with you. God's going to build it and he's going to, stir up some ambiguity in you. Not confusion. Don't confuse this. He's going to stir up some ambiguity. So ambiguity meaning he's not going to give you the full answer at once and he's going to see, he's testing you. He's testing you to see if it's going to drive you so crazy that you decide to go back in your flesh to receiving man's teaching rather than trusting him to give you the answers by his spirit. And let me tell you, I didn't pass the test. I didn't pass it a few times. And I write about this in A Soul Aligned, that every single time he told me to receive that from him, he told me, do not go to man. And every single time that I was like, oh, but there's like this little piece that you're not revealing to me. And I got to know. Every single time I went to a sermon or a commentary or Google I was deceived and it set me back several days and it stirred up more grief than was necessary, quite frankly, if I had just received it from him and trusted him and received that building process where he was also teaching me how to listen to him, how to learn from his spirit and that he is enough, how to trust that he's enough. So please spare yourself that grief and frustration. Don't, if, if he has not given you the full answer, you got to get comfortable with that. You got to demonstrate 
that you trust him, that you trust him to give you the answers, that you trust him to be able to communicate to you as only your creator can communicate to you. He's capable of doing that. He is enough. I'm telling you, he is enough. I hope that you will all take me up on this. I really, really pray that you will take me up on it. And I hope that you'll come back here and you'll share your process of him cleansing you of counterfeit Christianity, of the lies and delusions that you've ingested from counterfeit Christianity. If my wisdom and my testimony is helping you, do likewise. Not for my sake, but for the sake of others who, who are coming onto this channel and they're about to embark on that journey too, share with them. Share your process. Thank you so much for listening. God bless you and I'll see you in the next video.